I'm Rachel and this is my October 2018 reading wrap-up because uh, I didn't do any AM reading or Friday reads updates this month so I figured I'd lump it together all at the end. And here comes the part of the video where I claim that I will try not to ramble and then fail miserably. <laughs> Especially with eight books to talk about. <laughs> Starting with this one. This is A Palace of Pearls, The Stories of Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, as retold by Howard Schwartz. Uh, this was a generous gift from Steve Donahue uh, when he got an extra copy in the mail. And I started reading it on Yom Kippur, which was about uh, mid-September, and then I finished it relatively early uh, this month. <laughs> it took a little longer than I thought it would. We This uh, collection is divided into various forms of uh, fairy tales and folk tales and half-finished tales that uh, Reb Nachman, who was a Hasidic uh, Rebbe from the 19th century, uh, told his followers. And then there were also sections in here about stories that the Hasidim told about him. Uh, and following all of that was a commentary by uh, Howard Schwartz. Uh, and I went into this thinking it would be sort of like literary criticism, and I was so excited to read about fairy tales, and uh, it was a, such a kind of an interesting <laughs> disconnect, I guess, to read these stories that kind of read like your stereotypical medieval, even uh, European fairy tales, but uh, the emphasis behind them was uh, Jewish ideas, and usually pretty incorporeal, like uh, ideas of aspects of God and of being separated from God and looking for reunification with God rather than, uh, you know, morality about se female sexuality, that sort of thing. <laughs> so that, you know, the people weren't people at all in this story for the most part. And some of them they were, like in one story that really stuck with me. There were so many that <laughs> it was hard for one to stick with me, but one that really stuck with me was uh, Nachman trying to make sense of the fact that uh, in one of our biblical stories, uh, Jacob steals his brother's birthright, which is such a big no-no that they had to try to justify that. <laughs> I felt like Schwartz's uh, veneration of Nachman was a little too uh, out there, really. Like, he, he saw him as more of a literary genius than I did, but at the same time, I was struck by my own deficit in understanding the Jewish texts as much as Nachman and his followers would. That probably would have given me more of an insight into what they were talking about and more of a complex uh, understanding of the layers of all of it. Because one thing that Judaism does is tell and retell and retell and re-examine and rethink out all these stories and everything about life in the Talmud ad nauseum. <laughs> And then add in Kabbalah over all of that, which is completely esoteric. <laughs> so I did look at this a little bit as uh, literary criticism and uh, some of the ideas of Judaism, particularly of interest to the Hasidim, like about uh, this whole idea of reunif reunification with God and the Temple and the Messianic Age, which is something I tend to downplay personally, but you know, it actually is something that uh, traditionally it has been a big deal in Judaism, uh, the wait for the Messiah. And I also enjoyed uh, poking into how he uh, examined the Shekinah, which is uh, the idea of being exiled from God and is often uh, portrayed as a feminine trait so that uh, it's sort of an end way for women and uh, female characters like princesses sometimes. <laughs> but something that really uh, was an interesting thing that I didn't really think about when picking this up was how much... Uh, well, particularly Schwartz's commentary and the tales of the Hasidim told a story about Reb Nachman himself. I mean, this isn't a stand-in for a more traditional biography, I guess, but it's an interesting slant into the type of man that he might have been, and uh, uh, that, that he was, he seems to be very eccentric and to be rather egotistical, uh, which is sort of a given, given who he is. He was the great-grandson of the founder of Hasidim, and uh, basically took on the mantle from his great-grandfather over other members of his family who were older than him. So to have that sort of charisma and that sort of following, I think, and to see yourself as a sotic, I think some ego has to be involved in all of that. <laughs> so I definitely feel more interested to uh, maybe do a more traditional study of Reb Nachman himself. But I'm glad I read this still. Maybe it was a little bit beyond me, although I, I think I did okay with it and it was certainly very intriguing. Next, I'll briefly talk about the three books that I read for uh, Sammy Rohr this month. Uh, I've been chronicling this uh, Jewish Prize for Emerging Writers uh, 
for the last couple of years and uh, picking three for each of the years and uh, reading them. Uh, and so this month I did uh, 2014 and I have a whole video where I review these in depth, so I'll link that down below. But just to go over them briefly, I started with The Genius, Elijah of Vilna and the Making of Modern Judaism by Eliyahu Stern, which uh, really is a biography of uh, El Elijah of Vilna, known as the Gaon of, uh, of Vilna. <laughs> He was a uh, prominent uh, Jewish thinker and scholar in the 18th century, and of interest to what I was talking about, one thing he did was speak out against the Hasidim, and he thought their their piety was was a little bit too much of a front, and he was worried about uh, <laughs> the personality cults that they might bring in, which, <laughs> after reading about Nachman, uh, seems to, to be founded a little bit, the idea of being worried about a personality cult. <laughs> Uh, I do kind of think that Stern failed in trying to make a treatise that uh, it was Elijah Vilna who uh, brought about modern Judaism rather than the Enlightenment bringing it about because the people who really venerated him uh, lived later than he did and he wasn't really directly interested in their causes. He was very directly interested in, in studying Judaism for Judaism's sake not about more cultural uh, forms of expression like Zionism. Well, actually, Zionism is more complex than just to say cultural. But anyway, I think Stern, if he had wanted to make that argument, would have should have written more about those groups of people rather than about uh, the Gaon of Vilna. But uh, in doing so, he uh, did a nice little biography and also introduced me to ideas of what uh, Jewish life uh, was like uh, from the medieval ages to enlightenment in Europe. So that's fascinating all on its own. Next, I read Embodying Hebrew Culture, Aesthetics, Athletics, and Dance in the Jewish Community of Mandate Palestine by Nina S. Spiegel, where she takes uh, four forms of expression, or specific forms. She took a Miss Esther pageant, uh, modeled after a, a Jewish heroine in a Jewish holiday. She also took the Maccabi Games, or the Maccabea Games that are still going on. Uh, athletic uh, games between uh, Jewish athletes from different countries, and then she also took both traditional and folk dance and uh, talked about uh, what this community was trying to do in uh, sort of forcing this culture, really. It's not an organic thing at all. It's very much this community in Palestine trying to say, we're in our own homeland now and uh, we want to make an identity for ourselves. And there was some infighting and, of course, some uh, descent from the outside, from the British, from the Arabs, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's an interesting take into what people who feel without a culture and have been persecuted uh, do to try to make a sense of identity, a strong sense of identity. And finally, in my continuing uh, look into a Jewish America, I have Jews and Booze Becoming American in the Age of Prohibition by Marnie Davis, which takes a look at uh, how prohibition affected the Jews, which was mostly negatively, because uh, prohibition wasn't really much about uh, being concerned about alcoholics' consumption. It was about a form of nationalism and about trying to other immigrants, including American Jews. Uh, but um, Davis goes into uh, the ways that uh, various Jews dealt with uh, the build-up to the Volstead Act and then life during it uh, from Jews who uh, ran saloons and breweries to the uh, religious uh, members who were sort of, you know, the leaders of the community who, you know, talked to the people of the community and then intercommunity stuff. It follows the standard narrative that uh, a lot of the books about American Judaism I uh, have read follow about Jews trying to navigate uh, can they belong to white America and what types of concessions will they make and how much uh, will bigotry against them flare up or not because uh, Jews did inhabit uh, a sort of a murky space for a while in there. But this book in particular, since it's sort of so nativist and uh, anti-interculturalism in the form of uh, new immigrants particularly, uh, they come out usually uh, being scapegoated on the outside. But uh, it's an interesting look at a uh, part of American history. Next, I'll go into my speculative fiction picks of the month, starting with this one, my most anticipated science fiction novel of the year, Record of a Spaceborn Few by Becky Chambers. This is her third um, edition in the Wayfarer series, and I think this is unpopular, but this is my favorite. Uh, I figured it might be, and it kind of turned out to be. <laughs> uh, 
The Wayfarer series takes place in the far future when uh, Earthlings have <laughs> left Earth because, you know, Earth is dying. And uh, ultimately, uh, they make uh, alien contact uh, with some aliens who are far technologically superior to us, but uh, luckily they're pretty friendly, or friendly enough, it's not that easy, but friendly enough that ultimately they give uh, Earth places to colonize, and some humans, you know, just intermix with the aliens on their own homelands. And the first two books deal with uh, just a couple of humans in various situations, uh, uh, very uh, intercultural situations in terms of aliens. But this one actually is more homogeneous because it takes place on what remains of the Exodon fleet, which was um, sort of humanity's last drive to leave Earth and to uh, go find a new homeland. And uh, some of the members uh, actually stayed on the fleet even after uh, homelands were found because uh, they liked their way of life and they didn't necessarily want to uh, intermingle. And um, so even though they're dwindling and sort of seen as an anomaly, they still exist as this sort of uh, closed off community to a certain extent, except there are actually uh, some back and forth. Like one of the uh, aspects of the novel is this uh, alien uh, sociologist comes on board and talks with the, the archivist a bit and, and uh, we get to see parts of her treatise about uh, what the society is like. And we also follow various humans aboard the ship who, uh, you know, have various uh, conflicts and um, just normal interactions with life. I, I call this like suburbia and space. Like we have a teenager who's railing against like the norms of society and wants to find something that's all his own. We have a uh, caretaker for the dead who is uh, very satisfied in her personal life, in her professional life, but not so much her personal. And then we have a young mother who's uh, struggling with kids and so forth, who's uh, related to somebody from the first book. So it is sort of suburbia in space. It might not be the type of uh, science fiction that many people think of as science fiction. I mean, there's fascinating technology in this, but you know, it's not about dissecting the technology and seeing how it works. It's really about humans, uh, just put in this different sort of sphere. But to a certain extent, we're asking the same questions we're always asking, like, what do we do uh, in life that changes? Like, what do we, what traditions do we keep keep holding on to? And what do we do to, to evolve, as it were? Uh, and we're asked, we're talking about that on like a sort of a specific level with specific people and their specific lives. And then we also have a more general level, particularly with the archivist and the sociologist. And then we also do have a little bit of a plot, I promise, <laughs> uh, of uh, some things that are happening on the ship uh, that play into ideas of xenophobia and decrepit, decrepit technology and uh, like, uh, yeah, once again, what things should change with those and uh, how to uh, welcome newcomers or if to welcome newcomers. And uh, I just, I found it so fascinating. I mean, I'm kind of sad because it feels like a closed loop of a story that Chambers uh, delved into what it means to be on the Exodus fleet, and then she answered that question, so why go back to the fleet? Except that I love the fleet! <laughs> I love these stories! <laughs> this is optimistic science fiction without being, you know, unrealistic about it, I think, you know, to the extent of unrealism in this sort of science fiction. And I can also tell from the, uh, from the outskirts of the story there is so much more to say about the Galactic Commons, so I do hope that Becky Chambers will take us back. I think on her website she's promised to do that. <laughs> on the opposite end of the optimism-pessimism spectrum, we have this book, After Atlas, which I'm going to put here. Uh, usually I'm more tech-savvy and I go ahead and overlay an image, but <laughs> I don't know if I have the time for that. So I'm just going to show you this image on my uh, iPad because uh, I listen to this as an audiobook on Overdrive. So this is the uh, second of Emma Newman's Planetfall series. I really loved Planetfall, which is a book that takes place uh, with humans on a far-flung colony where they followed the Pathfinder, someone who ate a seed and has found the location to God, so she believes, and uh, people follow her to uh, see what God is all about. Uh, so that's uh, book one, but book two takes us back to Earth. We're in futuristic Earth, which again is a dying planet, but uh, we're still in the throes of all of that death and all of uh, the breakdown of society, as it were. Like, Western society has completely been taken over by GovCorps. <laughs> uh, and they are not democratic. <laughs> 
Our main character, Carlos, is a uh, detective, an indentured servant detective, who happens to be the son of a minor character from the first book who left him as a baby to join the Atlas crew. And he lives with his father, who, uh, or lived with his father, who did not make the cut. Uh, and his father was, uh, fell into a horrible funk and depression when, uh, when Carlos was a boy and incidentally uh, his homeland of Spain was crumbling all around him. I mean, the democracy was crumbling. And ultimately they were whisked away by um, this um, enigmatic uh, figure, Alejandro Casales, who started uh, a religious cult called The Circle. And Casales was another person who had been uh, looked over for the Atlas crew, and he was devastated, but then he tried to sort of reclaim his life in a sort of uh, anti-technology sort of way. And uh, Carlos lived with them for a while, and then he thought he had to escape. Uh, and then, what, what do you know, but uh, Casales is murdered, and Carlos is brought on by the GovCorps to help uh, solve the case, because they have their own agendas of wanting to deal with him, and they're, you know, covering up the truth. <laughs> but we ultimately figure out what happens. Uh, and I'm not a huge person into uh, the mystery genre, but, you know, the emotion you could just scoop up with a spoon. All of uh, Carlos's backstory, uh, uh, Newman just does so well with exploring emotionally traumatized characters with Ren in the first book and now Carlos in this one. It's just, it's enough to just keep me hooked like a magnet on a refrigerator. <laughs> And anyway, uh, needless to say, Casales' death does play into larger world themes, particularly because the book opens 40 years after Atlas left, and uh, the world is waiting for uh, the opening of a, a capsule that the crew of Atlas left behind. They have no idea what's in it. They assume it's coordinates to follow Atlas off of Earth, which is dying, and uh, to join them in space on God's colony. Uh, so that is looming large in the foreground of, of the general story, and uh, Casales uh, was passed over at one point to be a member of Atlas, but uh, things go on from there. I don't want to spoil any of the plotty elements of that. I will say, in general, this felt like a hugely cynical novel. Uh, I mean, you know, there's no democracy. <laughs> There's indentured servitude, which is really slavery. On a personal level, Casales' life is horrible, not only because he's a slave, but because uh, his relationships with uh, his father and his mentor are non-existent, um, and that they've hurt him so much and he has to deal with that. And in general, yes, being run by GovCorps is not something that helps out all of the people. It only helps out some of the people. And that's not good news when the planet is dying and everybody needs a way off. <laughs> So I'll leave it at that. I don't want to, to spoil anything. Uh, again, you know, the, the cynicism, I think, if, if Newman had taken a couple more steps at, uh, into cynical land, it would have been too much for me, and I would have thought that uh, this is just, you know, unsupported nihilism. But I was uh, invested enough to the layer that she took it that I could believe it, and I did love the characters. She just, again, is wonderful with emotional characters, and I still distinctly remember uh, listening to the last hour on my uh, commute home, the last hour of the story, and I was walking home, and then I just stood here in my bedroom <laughs> in the dark as the story ended, and I just felt completely washed over with emotion about that ending, which I did, even if I spoiled myself on it because I was stupid and read the synopsis for Atlas Alone, the fourth book, which is coming out next year, and I definitely intend to read that one uh, after reading Before Mars, which uh, is out, and uh, I'm kind of waiting for the audiobook. Maybe I should just read it. I don't know. Anyway, I'm I, I found it wonderful. I'm starting to see themes that uh, link the books together. Themes, of course, between this book and Planetfall, and things that seem to speak to maybe what Before Mars is about. I'll have to wait and see. But I just found it so epically moving, even if it's just so dark. <laughs> Speaking of dark science fiction and audiobooks, then I listened to this one. This is An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. It's a story that uh, sort of breaches the line between young adult and adult speculative fiction. It's something I think uh, young adult listeners could get into because uh, there is a general thorough line through this about a girl saving the world, as it were. It's not really that simple at all. But Aster is a slave on a generation ship that is uh, modeled after the Antebellum South. So she's a dark-skinned lower decker who does slave work for the uh, lighter-skinned upper deckers, basically. 
Um, and so they're on this ship that probably left Earth for the same reasons uh, that uh, I talked about in the last two books. But uh, the narrative now, 300 years after leaving, is uh, something that borders on an evangelism of religion. Uh, they're trying to reach the promised land. Their uh, leader basically has pope-like uh, powers or, you know, authority within uh, the society. And Aster is uh, unusually close to power because she works with the surgeon, who is uh, the uh, nephew of, uh, the, uh, of the newest sovereign, and also uh, no friend to her. <laughs> but I think this is a lot more adult in uh, that uh, Solomon doesn't focus on, you know, building up that superhero, supervillain uh, story. She's much more interested in the characters and in the price of, of bigotry. Of, of what that does to, well, to the dark skinners, uh, to, to Aster's people in particular, who also aren't just Aster's people. She does go into uh, differentiating between different cultures in the lower decks. There's also a scientific uh, storyline about uh, Aster's mother who uh, died under mysterious circumstances, and Aster uh, goes to follow her trail and uh, figure out what she knew about the ship and their journey. I mean, I think that the spacefaring stuff is really clever, and uh, I love generation ships and thinking about what it means uh, to traverse the stars, but the real selling point of this is the exploration of what it means when society others some of its people and uh, what that sort of violence does to people. I think that is really the heart and soul of this brutal story. <laughs> but I definitely recommend it, and again, I think it's accessible to uh, YA readers while having uh, somewhat more of a mature storytelling apparatus. And finally, I just finished this book, uh, Breaking and Entering by Eileen Pollock. A couple of weeks ago I did a hugely long video where I did a uh, page 112 tag between this and another Jewish-themed literary fiction book, and then I also did a try a chapter tag for um, some YA fantasy snippets that I got from uh, San Diego Comic-Con back in July. But anyway, uh, I think I, I did the right thing by choosing this, vo this book. It turned out to be more uh, timely than I even thought it was uh, when I read the synopsis about uh, Californians moving to Michigan during uh, the Oklahoma City bombing and uh, probing red and blue states during this time of fissure in America, uh, also with the Michigan militia running around, and then what do you know, uh, white nationalists have uh, been much more present of late in the past uh, couple of uh, weeks. Which, by the way, I meant to say this with the Sammy Roar video, but uh, in the beginning of that video I do give some of my uh, more immediate thoughts about uh, Tree of Life synagogue uh, bombing in Pittsburgh, you know, the worst anti-Semitic attack on U.S. soil. So, anyway, this book uh, is mostly told from the perspective of Louise, who uh, moves to Michigan with her husband, who uh, who is a therapist whose client commits suicide, and he's not really able to get over it, so he needs a change of pace, so off they go to Michigan, and uh, she's having a lot more trouble acclimating than he is. Uh, She's in a job where her superior really doesn't like her that much, uh, and, and uh, she's not really able to make friends with the neighbors. She is a bit uh, prejudiced of them, I think, she, she, uh, and of the right-wing culture that they embody. Although Pollock also doesn't shy away from uh, their vitriol about, uh, about the government in particular. Richard, meanwhile, who's the son of a Holocaust survivor, actually uh, befriends some of the, these uh, militia types, the ones that don't seem uh, to be actively anti-Semitic anyway, and it seems to be his way of trying to reclaim his manhood, but it's uh, one of the aspects that is putting a strain on his relationship with Louise, who does end up in an affair. But uh, this is a very interior-driven book for the most part, so, and uh, I feel like uh, Louise's character is fascinating and flawed, and uh, the affair is torrid, but it's also, I think, meandered through complexly, as is uh, her reaction to uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, which happens during this uh, book, and also the reactions of the people around town. Uh, well, we do get some other POV ch uh, characters from time to time, even if Louise is the most permanent. 
we get her husband Richard for a couple chapters, we get her lover Ames for a couple of chapters. We get one chapter with Matt, uh, who is their neighbor, who's a right-winger and I think uh, and a militiaman, who also I think gives some depth of, of character to, to, to someone of that persuasion. Uh, and we get one chapter from her daughter Molly, which really I, I feel like that was her weakest chapter and she didn't really do enough with building up this young character. It was really more about giving plot information that Louise wouldn't be aware of. I think the strengths of this book are asking on a personal and a more political uh, level, what does it mean to impose your worldview or your version of events on other people? And suddenly when you uh, get weighed into the murky waters of affairs or sort of paranoid uh, survivalist culture, I know the answers and cloud up a bit. <laughs> I think, you know, this is literary fiction, so it does come down to the characters and uh, that I think uh, Louise's voice was strong and that uh, it was flawed, but that she was uh, striving to, to find a sense of herself in uh, her relationships and in this broader world. And that's uh, something that really sings out to me. And I really like the conflagration of uh, the broader political world and then her personal world. I wasn't as thrilled with the Judaism in the book, although for the most part I don't think that was Pollock's fault. She was just describing Jews I don't like that much. <laughs> Their relationships with Judaism, that is. Uh, I do kind of blame Pollock for uh, Ames's wife, uh, who uh, her decisions and her storyline seemed to be more of a uh, straw woman. Uh, she was there more, more to create conflict than to be a believable character. But other than that, I found this to be a thought-provoking read and a great way to end the month. And finally, you can find a link to my literary newsletter down below where I have uh, snippets of my Goodreads reviews for all eight of these books and then also other goodies like uh, literary news that caught my eye and a book pick spotlight and a book meme and a TBR and etc. So that about covers it for me now. I will be back on this channel sometime on Wednesday, I hope, to upload my first NaNoWriMo vlog, a week one vlog of 2018. And that'll be most of my output for the month, although sometime mid-month I plan to come in with an author's answer video. Although technically, now that I think about it, that probably also will be NaNoWriMo related. <laughs> what can I say? Tis the season, everyone. So I hope all of you participating are doing well with your word counts. Keep writing, keep writing, and uh, thanks so much for watching. <laughs> I'll see you next time.